Thank you, Zoom lady. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the October meeting of WebNet and our first meeting of the academic year. My name is Jesse Loesberg. I am hosting today. I am the web developer for the, for the UC Berkeley Library, and I'm the WebNet. I am on the WebNet Steering Committee. Um, if you are interested in seeing what else we have in store for the rest of the year, our various subjects and our dates for our next talks, uh, you can go to webnet.berkeley.edu. I will drop that link in the chat presently. Da, 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 da. Still got more people coming in. Here we go. Um, one little housekeeping item. If you have questions, please enter them into the Q&A, not into the chat. Uh, Lucy has graciously offered to answer questions while she's going, so I will be uh, pausing here and there to uh, let Lucy know that we have questions and um, to uh, read them as necessary. Um, Lucy is our presenter today. This is Lucy Greco. She is an accessibility evangelist with a campus IT experience within Berkeley IT. Today, she's going to be talking about the history of digital accessibility. And with that, I will hand it over to Lucy. Thank you, Jesse. And I am also yeah. a member of the WebNet Steering Committee. So welcome to the first 2023-2024 calendar year of WebNet. And without further ado, uh, I've got 27 slides and we've got like about 45 minutes if we want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to skim a lot of these and the slides will actually be available after the fact. So um, hold on with me because the first couple of slides are going to go really fast, but they're just background and interesting data. And then we'll get to the real stuff. So without further ado, let's begin. So where it all began, um, as you'll see on this slide, the first known blind student to graduate was 1896. I was somewhat surprised myself. I um, knew the history of Newell Perry, and I didn't realize that it was 1896. I thought it was in the 1930s. So I think it's really important to note that students were coming here before the turn of the 1900s. Then you'll note that we actually had a blind faculty member start in 1942, uh, Jacobus Tenbrook, and he was not only a faculty member, but a huge legislative power. He actually started the National Federation for the Blind and did a lot of advocacy work and supported students on campus, blind and not, in several different ways. And when I was looking up the history, it actually said that he helped a lot of students' rights groups on campus um, to try and get the campus to be the democratic social campus that we are today. Okay. The cave. So, um, hold it. Why is that slide there? <laughs> I'm sorry. So the cave was a room that was uh, put aside uh, for the students of, with disabilities in the 1970s. It was, a dark, dank room in the depths of the Moffat Library. I believe it still exists in the exact same, you know, form where the rooms, you know, the study cubicles and the office and the server room are all still there as they are. It is in the sub-basement of Moffat, and it was a really hard place to get into. Uh, you had to go through an old rickety elevator that for the five years I worked there, I swore was never gonna uh, make it to the office every time I stepped in. Or the students who uh, didn't wanna necessarily trust that elevator would sneak in through the loading dock uh, of Moffat Library and go into the cave that way. And they all, had they all had keys to the room and they could go there 24 hours a day. Uh, there was all kinds of fun stuff in that space, including a uh, Webster's pocket dictionary and I'm emphasizing the word pocket because the pocket dictionary in Braille was 48 volumes uh, that were three and a half inches thick each. So I'd like to know whose pocket that would fit in. All right. So in the 60s, there was a 
radical movement in general on campus. You all know the Cesar Chavez movement, but how many of you here are aware of the disability rights movement that happened? In 1968, as was on the slide that I didn't cover, um, a group of people with disabilities, the leader of which was Ed Roberts, who was a polio survivor, came to campus and they were all students wanting to get an education and having to struggle for their rights on campus. Uh, these students were loud. They were, uh, boy, you know, they made sure that, you know, what they needed was what they got. And, you know, they started the civil rights movement. Not only did they start the civil rights movement here at Berkeley, but they actually started the entire civil rights movement. Uh, there's several exhibits about this on campus. There is a major exhibit about this on campus in the, um, oh, I can't remember which library it's in, but it's in one of the libraries on campus that's gonna be available for the next six months. But it also talks about, you know, the fact that these people went on and started the civil rights movement in our nation. The 1976 sit-in uh, in San Francisco, a bunch of different civil rights actions to the national crawl on the stairs of the Capitol, you know, that led to the ADA that we all, as people with disabilities, believe in and, you know, owe our ability to get educations, do jobs, participate in the world in general today. All right, so now we're getting to the crux of this, technology. So what technologies did people use? Well, early on, there were reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. And these reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, uh, I, don't, I wasn't able to get an image of one, but a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder was a pretty big item. And students would actually carry these reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders to class and record their faculty and record the lectures and the seminars that they participated in. Um, there were really interesting new innovations happening in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, and we're going to cover a lot of those today. Um, you know, these things were all heavy. They were bulky. They were, um, you know, really tough for people to carry around. So that's why they were given the cave to store these items and go find a place to use them on campus. Is this the slide with an image on it, Jesse, or is that the next one? Yes, Lucy, this uh, has an image on it. It has what I believe is the Perkins Brailler. Perfect, thank you, yes. And the Perkins Brailler, just so everybody hears a nice little interesting story. This is a classic Perkins Brailler, which was uh, one of the first ones they made. And I don't know how early they started making them, but these were, heavy devices. I think they weighed somewhere from 15 to 25 pounds. They were made of solid steel on the outside and had really intricate mechanisms on the inside. And you'll see it has six keys on it. And this was how, you know, even myself as a child used to produce Braille on paper. And I would carry this thing around with me in high school and it was really funny because I would only carry it for the first two or three weeks. And I'd be, you know, running through the classroom, like or running through the hallways, like every other student. But I had this big, heavy thing next to me. And it kind of, you know, I can't tell you how many kneecaps I probably uh, hit with that thing. But after about two or three weeks, I could stop carrying the brailler. And even if I wasn't carrying it, the hallways would clear for me. So, you know, I had the nickname of Moses when I was in high school because, you know, wherever I'd go, the hallway would path the hallway path would clear. So if anybody wanted to get somewhere quickly, they would just kind of ride in my tailwind. So entering the personal computer. So uh, personal computers were, I think they say the first PC was an Apple in the seventies, maybe a PC in the nine or sorry in the 1980s uh, that Microsoft released MS DOS on, and these tools were really cool for people with disabilities because it gave them opportunities they didn't previously have. You know, the personal computer 
had word processing on it and it had the ability to do a lot of things that people with disabilities needed. Uh, Jesse, could you quickly remind me what's on this slide just so I... The title of this slide is In the 1980s. Yep. And the first bullet point is due to the civil rights laws that were fought for starting in Berkeley. Does that help? Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. So sure. we had a lot of students with disabilities at Cal, a lot of them. Um, you know, we were known to be the place where people with disabilities could come and get an education. But more importantly, be a place where you could actually join a community of fellow people with disabilities. It is a really important cultural aspect of disability to connect with other people with disabilities. Uh, many, many people in this world grow up with a disability, uh, you know, live and die with that disability and never actually meet another person with a disability. And that's because, you know, cultural norms are to, you know, keep people protected and sheltered and they don't realize that people with disabilities actually have, you know, the, the means and wherewithal to actually participate in society and be, you know, viable members of society. So when the word started getting out about Berkeley, people with disabilities started flocking here. And we had a lot of students, a lot of students. And I believe this is a slide where I list the three programs that I know of that were developed on campus to help people with disabilities. The Disabled Students Program and the Disabled Students Residence Program and the CAVE. So we already talked about what the CAVE was, how this place was a place where blind people could go 24 hours a day, hang out and get their work done, but meet other people with disabilities and do all kinds of fun things sometimes maybe not so legal, but you know, they're students, they do whatever they need to do. Um, the residence program, I wanna spend a moment to maybe mourn this with you all a little bit, was a fantastic program that was set up shortly after uh, Ed Roberts and his cohort left, that was funded by the California State Department of Rehabilitation. And it was a program that students with multiple disabilities or severe disabilities who were young and just coming out of high school and maybe not knowing how to actually live as independent ex disabled adults would sign up for this program and we would provide all sorts of support mechanisms for them. Everything from teaching them how to hire attendant cares, how to manage their schedules. We would teach them how to apply for funding. We would, you know, help them you know, navigate the maze of Social Security Administration, all kinds of fun things, but also technology. And that technology aspect of the Disabled Students Residence Program uh, was something I was actually initially hired on to do in that my job was to come in evaluate these students in the residence program and say, okay, so you have no hands and don't have the ability to type. So let's see how we can get you producing your papers and what technology we can give you. Or in one case, we had a student who, you know, needed to be able to read in bed. So it went as simple as getting her a book stand that her computer could sit on, that she could easily operate while she was laying in bed. Uh, the technologies I researched went from everywhere from you know, mechanized blind lifters to, uh, you know, I, I helped them sometimes think about bed lifts, although the residence program was better at that than I was, to speech recognition, to, you know, reading assistance type tools, you name it. That program was so phenomenal. And when we lost that program at Berkeley, I believe we lost a huge, uh, a huge part of our responsiveness and our social culture at Berkeley. So this is, a, this is maybe a, a myth, the title of this slide. Maybe it's not a myth, but we were known to be the place where people with disabilities came. We were known to be a place where there was tons and tons of students with disabilities. And students are a really good source for testing our work. How many times have I done talks where I've said, you know, go to our students, get them to help you test. Uh, 
this was something that started really early on. So I have two examples here, but there were many, many more. The first one, Berkeley Systems. How many people remember uh, After Dark and the Flying Toasters? There you go, Lexi. <laughs> So the company that made that um, After Dark and the Flying Toasters and all those wonderful scream savers, the owner of the company's wife was blind and visually impaired, and he noticed that she was not able to use the computers he loved and was making his living off of. So his company, he hired a couple of Berkeley grads and a couple of students who were in college and a couple of really good engineers, and they created the first graphical user interface screen reader outspoken. Um, these students tested it, they used it, it was installed on Macs on campus early on, and it was, as far as I am concerned, to this day, the best graphical user interface for a blind person on a computer. I mean, it's it, it really worked and it did an amazing job for um, making sure a blind person could get through a, a GUI. And then Win Wizard was a product designed for students primarily with dyslexia. And it was a tool that helped students with dyslexia or ADHD or other uh, learning disabilities read documents. It wasn't a screen reader like all the screen readers I've used and I've demoed many times. It was a text reader and it would take blocks of text and read it to a person with dyslexia who might have, you know, an inability to read and might do things like as it's speaking the text, highlight the text as it goes. And, you know, it had all kinds of things like common and checkers and it, it, it was just an amazing tool. Well, it was developed with the input of students with disabilities in the disabled students program. Uh, for many, many years, they, you know, credited Berkeley for being the place that allowed them to develop that product. So my story. So I was a child of the 80s. I started school in 1976 and there was no technology for me. I learned how to read Braille, but it turns out I am, you know, those of you who don't know me, I am totally blind, but I am not a good Braille reader. And it's because I realized later in life that I actually have dyslexia as well as blindness. So, you know, I can't tell you how often I have spoken, you know, how to spell something and my hands just type it the wrong way. Or uh, I blame the fact that I learned Braille early on for this as well, partially, because in Braille, a lot of characters are reversed from each other. So in the Braille alphabet, the E and the I just point the different directions. The D and the F point different directions. The H and the J point different directions. So, you know, how does that uh, help a blind person with dyslexia? It doesn't. It just makes it that much worse. And I think those of you who've, you know, seen me type on campus know that, uh, you know, writing isn't my strength. Speaking is my strength. So, um. Computers came out and these computers let us do things like word processing. It was amazing. How I was in, uh, introduced to these was when I was in junior high, I started getting paper assignments and I would find out about the paper assignments as early as possible, sometimes before the rest of the class, because it would take me three to five times longer than the rest of the class to do a paper assignment. And this was just like, you know, simple creative writing assignments. If it was a three page paper, I'd inevitably try and get them, talk them down to a page and a half because when I had to write a paper, I would sit at a typewriter and I would type it and right behind me would sit my itinerant teacher. And if I hit the wrong character on the keyboard, she would whip out a bottle of liquid paper and she would erase that character. And we had a rule. If there were more than three liquid paper swatches on the page, we had to tear out the page and do it over again. So can you imagine the horror and pain of if I had to do three pages, if I sometimes had to even get over a page, it would take hours and hours of work and effort. And I could not get those assignments in on time. Then they gave me my first computer, the Apple IIe. And I had a word processor. 
And it wasn't a word processor like we think of today. It was a very primitive word processor that for formatting things, for example, I had to put in um, formatting codes. I, I doubt we have anybody here who knows what I'm talking about when I say formatting codes, but these were literally, I would put dollar sign and then I'd put a character after the dollar sign to say what I wanted it to do. So if I wanted to center something, I would put dollar sign C. If I wanted to make a paragraph with an indent, I would go dollar sign P. And dollar sign we L. At least three of us are, are nodding along with you right now, just so you know. <laughs> okay, great. Excellent. So, you know, I, you know, this was, to me, a phenomenal thing. The thing it did was I could type. And if I made a mistake, I didn't have to whip out the liquid paper. Liquid paper was gone. It was wonderful. I still made spelling mistakes and I still had problems, but I didn't have to ask for those extensions anymore. This was a really critical thing for me. And then I was introduced to BitNet and BitNet Relay. And we all know what IRC is because we've all used IRC in some form or other. But before IRC was RC, which was Relay Chat. And Relay Chat was set up between, I think it was about a thousand universities around the world, one or two research, military research facilities, but primarily universities. Berkeley was one of these universities and the University of Calgary was also one of these universities. And that's where I went to, that's where I was at the time in um, late years of high school. And I went, started my university career at the University of Calgary. And somebody there came up with this really clever idea of putting people with disabilities online and connecting them to each other and, you know, following them over the years to see you know, what the impact was of giving these people access to each other, but giving them access to technology. And um, it was a really interesting experiment because the one thing that they introduced us to was Gopher. I'm going to move slides. Oh, I covered this one already. Well, uh, I think I just... I think I just blew the slides, didn't I? You did, Lucy. Uh, Jesse, can you, uh, are you in a position? Uh, no, to... I'll get there. Yeah. So... Okay. We just need to be on the right page. Yeah. Come on. We're Come almost on. there. Come on. Hold on, sorry. Sorry, that's what happens if your hand, if your fingers are too fat. I think, Lucy, I think that's the right page for you. There we go. Come on, where's that next button? Okay, so this is the right slide page. Um, all yes, right, all right, so um, I'm really sorry. I've been rushing so much and I've kind of lost my trend. So Gopher was this wonderful tool. Uh, Lisa, you said you actually administrated Gopher at one point. Is that correct? Or was that somebody else I'm thinking of? No, I, you know, I didn't really administrate it for the library, but I certainly was a content editor. And that's how I wiggled my way into library IT <laughs> from being a copy cataloger. Okay. It was fascinating. <laughs> And it was amazing. It was a truly liberating tool. Um, Gopher for me was all of a sudden, I didn't have to like find people to read me things. I didn't have to, you know, go into the library and work with a librarian or, you know, 10 different friends just to find the articles I needed. I would just go to Gopher and I'd type in a search term and 15 hits would come up and, you know, Maybe I wasn't getting the same content that everybody else was, but I was getting content and I could read it and I just loved it. And it was absolutely amazing. And this is what the, the research project that gave me access to it did was they wanted people to use Gopher and see you know, how, it, how it affected their outcomes. Um, most people who were in this research project were from across Canada and they were signing, they were signing in with... Um, pay by the character type uh, internet service providers. So 
the research study paid for all their hours and all their time spent online. And they would spend probably about 100,000 a year to get these 150 people into the system and pay for their data. But I was lucky because I was in Calgary. So, you know, they weren't able to, they didn't have to pay for my stuff because I could just dial up directly to the university where the process was being hosted. And then I accidentally found Relay, Relay Chat. And this was like amazing, this absolutely phenomenal tool that I could talk to people in real time around the world. And I was talking to somebody in Germany one day, which was the furthest away I'd talked to somebody. And it was so cool. And in those days, you knew how the internet was designed. You knew that, you know, because it wasn't really an internet, it was just a beginning of a web. So I knew that in the city of Calgary, my internet went from the city of Calgary to the city of Edmonton. Then from Edmonton, it would go to, and I'm saying names that you guys have no idea where they are, but it went through Saskatchewan and went through two different cities in Saskatchewan. And then it would jump over Manitoba and go to, you know, the University of Waterloo. And then I could branch out several different places around the U.S., and to get next door to the province of British Columbia, I would have to go through the University of Washington. So, you know, the connection between my closest neighbor was actually around the entire U.S. and integral. So when the connection went down between Germany, I was angry, I was upset, and I was like breaking all the rules because in those days there were rules on chat. And one of them was don't swear. And I was swearing like crazy because I was this, you know, young teenage kid and I was like, mad because you know this great experience of talking to this guy in Germany was cut off and this little voice came in and I say a little voice because my screen reader read it saying ah I see that the computer is down in Saskatchewan again I'm like uh oh I thought it was by myself nobody was here who was that and I, I looked up this person and it was a, a really cool command you had to use in those days if you wanted to know who somebody was you would finger them so i you know fingered this person and it turned out it was a system administrator in edmonton and i was like uh oh the system administrator just saw me breaking the rules i'm, I'm gonna get banned i'm never gonna be able to be on this thing again today that person is my husband so i didn't get banned everybody you still see me on the internet today. Um, and I thought you guys would like that little story, but it was liberating. The technology really did help those of us who needed to, you know, get another way to communicate and a way to get information and share with one another and meet people and, you know, meet the person that I spent the rest of my life with. The Opticon, this was not an internet technology, but an amazing piece of technology. Um, I was first introduced to this as early as grade four. It was this wonderful device and you'll see an image of it here. And it had a little camera and the little camera would, you'd use your right hand for it usually. I mean, I think some left-handed people used it, but you'd put your right hand um, on the camera and you roll in straight lines across the page and it had these little bars that you know accommodated you rolling it in straight lines because as a blind person you know it's very easy to draw a diagonal line or a wavery line and they even had this special uh, guide rail thing that if you couldn't draw a state line you could just move back and forth on the track that they provided you and You'd then put your device, your your left hand in the other device there, and there was a little um, raised area that your index finger would go into. And the index finger is important because that's the finger that we use for Braille, both left and right hand. The index finger is the one we use because it's the most sensitive. And it would vibrate little lines under my finger in the shape of letters. So I would slowly move the camera and I would see C-A-T and then I'd see a gap and then I'd realize, okay, cat. And It was like reading Braille, but feeling the print letters and not reading Braille. I was not a great uh, Opticon user. I never actually got one myself, although it was a very cool device to have because I couldn't use it for more than 10 to 15 minutes at a time. 
because my finger would just go numb and then I'd lose sensitivity and I couldn't feel what was happening anymore. However, my brother, who was also blind, had one at the time as well. He's much older than I am. And he used it to get through university. He uses one to this very day. Um, as you see on the slide, I say that some people who still have them swear you'll have to pull it out of their cold, dead hands because it was such a life changer. You could do things that, you know, today we think of use your mobile phone to scan a device and read a product. Well, the Opticon could do that for you. And you could not only read the the characters on a on an item but you could actually get a sense of what the image was if you were good enough with an opticon okay we've talked about gopher like i said i'm out of order so i'm just going to skip this the kurzweil reading machine an amazing piece of technology it was a partnership it turns out between ray kurzweil's company and xerox the first one of these was the size of two washing machines um, put together and sold for $200,000. So um, who's going to buy that for their kid? Nobody. And what universities was gonna, were going to buy that? Uh, none of them. I mean, there was just, there was no resources to buy these things. They had 10 of them that were made as a proof of concept and they were spread out across the country. I do not think we had one here at Berkeley. I think that uh, we missed version one of the reading machine. Although from what I understand, they had one of the later versions, probably version three or four. And it was an incredible tool. You could walk up to it and you could put a book down on the surface and you could scan that book. And my brother used one of the third generations at the University of Calgary, and he said it was helpful, but not not the ideal solution because the formatting in his textbooks, he was a business student, was sometimes so hard that the machine couldn't get it. It used optical character recognition to read the textbook, and it was very primitive optical character recognition. It was not able at first to determine if the text was in multiple columns. It didn't know what to do if there was a picture in the middle of the page. You know, the optical character recognition we use today still goes under the name of Kurzweil in the Disabled Students Program, by the way. We actually have licensing for the current Kurzweil product on campus. Um, it's not in any way connected to Ray Kurzweil at all, but it is, you know, still the main concept of reading and how to read for students with disabilities. It was amazing software and it was really a, an eye-opening piece of technology. Um, the Reading Edge was the last version of the actual hardware versions of these pieces of technology. Uh, the first one I saw was bought by a friend of mine who worked for Shell Oil. She was a blind employee and Shell bought her one of these. And it was literally two giant pieces. I mean, if anybody remembers the old giant CPUs that weighed probably about 25, 30 pounds, the scanner weighed that much and the CPU weighed that much. And it had this teeny tiny little keypad with seven keys on it to do all the functions you needed to do with this machine. Luckily, you didn't have to sit at the machine to do all the reading. You could just scan the pages and then save everything on a floppy disk and go back to your computer at home and read it. So that was that was a great thing. And the last version of these was actually one that was designed with the CPU and the scanner all as one piece. And I actually had one of these. Um, we found one in 2000. 2003 on eBay. Actually, maybe it was more like 2007, and I bought it, and I had this thing, and it still worked. In July, I had a young boy who was blind and visually impaired who was really interested in technology and the history of technology, and he, you know, I showed him this thing, and I he took it home because he thought it was so cool that he could, you know, read something with this device. And it actually did a really decent job. 
not the best, but it did a decent job of reading text and it knew how to do column differentiation, for example. Screen readers, there was lots of screen readers. Define the term screen reader. I should have probably done that on this slide. Screen reader is software that lets a blind person access the computer screen in, in multiple different ways giving them the ability to identify that something is a menu, something is a button, something is a list, what have you. And the earliest screen readers that ran in DOS, you know, would do things like be able to identify if text was in a different color. So, you know, the first uh, DOS screen reader I used actually had a spell checker. And this was like, oh my God, for me, heaven on earth. And the way I had to use the spell checkers because you know software in those days was not as accessible as it is today. I'm not saying software is accessible today, but it wasn't as accessible then even. It would put a little floating window over top of the text and that floating window would have the choices and then you'd be able to like arrow through the choices and click the one you wanted. But what it would do is it would put the top choice in a different color than the primary text. So I set my screen reader when I was spell checking to read me only the text of that color and I'd be able to go to the list and read which word was in that color and arrow up and down and choose the one I wanted and then hit enter. It was amazing. Um, that was a product called SoftVert. Uh, Vert was a, a device first. It was all the software was on this huge box and it was bigger than a standard monitor. So just so you kind of have an idea of how big the box was. And then I used SoftVert. And then I have a list here of various different uh, screen readers that were used throughout the country. I think I forgot to put Flipper on this list. So I will update that list a little later and add Flipper. But you'll see that Outspoken for Mac was um, on that list. And again, I, you know, an amazing, an amazing tool for you know, a blind person to be able to use a GUI. So Apple products, you know, when Apple first came out, their Apple IIe's that shipped with accessibility software were really amazing. It was able to be a product that first of all, school district could afford, um, you know, for those of you who are my age and beyond, you might remember your, junior high or high school, having an Apple IIe available for career counseling and all different kinds of things like that. That was really, you know, a new environment. We were, we were just on the cutting edge of what we could do with computers. And the Apple IIe had several products that would actually focus on being something that a blind person could use. That was the first word processor I used. This one didn't have a spell check, remember, in the formatting tools. But Apple went through some changes and, you know, from Steve Jobs leaving and Steve Jobs coming back, when he came back, I think that Apple became a less socially conscious company. I think that they became very profit driven. And they also had some very security driven issues as well. So they didn't want a screen reader that could hack the operating system and be able to sit between the, you know, sit between the RAM, the video and, and memory and be able to figure out what's on the screen at any one time. And so they made it impossible for Outspoken to continue to work on their, on their system. And to this day, I actually have a, a a deep embedded resentment of Apple products. I, I actually hate Apple as a company because I felt that they abandoned me. You know, I was a zealot in the 90s and in 1997, I was no longer able to use a, a Mac computer until 2005 when uh, it turns out a school district in uh, I think Michigan, but I'm not sure exactly what state, was sued because a blind child was not able to use the Mac that the classroom had. And Apple had to come to the help of this school district because they were gonna lose all the computers because they had had a contract to have a computer on every desk. And they developed voiceover. 
and voiceover was a very powerful screen reader. Um, I don't think it's as good as outspoken was, but then I don't think very many screen readers were as good as outspoken was. Uh, to this day, I actually struggle using voiceover, even though I was one of the primary uh, people on the uh, beta seed for Apple to test outspoke or voiceover, sorry. And voiceover, you know, is built in. And this started the idea that operating systems and companies should actually build in accessibility. Uh, shortly thereafter, you know, the first Windows screen reader came out and the first Windows screen reader was JAWS for Windows. And then several others were available shortly thereafter. And, you know, Microsoft built their own screen reader within a few years. They started by creating a product called Narrator. And they always said for many, many years that, you know, Narrator is not a screen reader. It's just the way to get to the screen reader. Although today it's actually as a very competitive screen reader built into Microsoft, I wouldn't call it you know, a screen reader to this day because it's really hard still to use, but it's built in. You can get a Linux screen reader built in. You can get an Apple screen reader built in. Mobile phones have uh, screen readers built in. You know, having something be part of the operating system got rid of that fear of, well, we can't have this screen reader sitting in the operating system. Instead, the operating system has its own screen reader. Hey, uh, Lucy, I just want to give you a little yep. heads up that it is uh, 12.45. Thank you. Thank you. So I just covered what's on this slide. And again, you all have a chance to look at the slides yourself later. Random useful stuff, like everything that we were becoming in the digital age was becoming accessible. Um, you know, for my ninth birthday, my father bought me a sharp talking calculator that had a clock and a calculator in it. And actually, I still have one of these. I, I have a running, uh, what do you call it, search on eBay for these devices. And if they sell for under $35, I buy them all because a lot of blind people remember these from their youth and everybody wants one of them. So I just give them away as gifts when I find them. Uh, the LiveScribe pen was a very amazing tool, you know, that I think some of us probably have used as you wrote notes on a sheet of paper, a special sheet of paper, it would audio record what was happening in the room around you. So if you were a student in the classroom, it would record the lecture and then your notes. And if you were wondering why on earth did I write that note, you could tap the pen on the page later and it would play back the audio from that session. Well, it turns out that thing had a lot more practical uses than just being a note taker. So a Berkeley grad worked with the inventor of the pen to create the ability to mark up diagrams for blind people. And these diagrams for blind people, the first one they did to pr have a proof of concept was a periodic table. And so it was a simple 11 by 17 sheet of paper that had the grid for the periodic table and it had you know, just the two letter characters for the element on there. But you could use your live, live scribe pen on that page. And if you touched it, it would actually pronounce the name. If you touched it again, it would give you a little bit more information and you could go 10 layers deep to get as much information as possible just from that one 17 by 11 sheet of paper, which was never able to be done in the past. Gadgets for everyone, just more and more gadgets. All these things were becoming you know, useful. We had things called braille note takers uh, for blind people. And these braille note takers, one was called the braille and speak. Uh, there was things called a parrot. That, that one was never called a braille note taker. It was more of a, a little PDA, but we were using PDAs before they became popular as blind people. And you know, it was basically a little word processing application that had a braille keyboard. You could type in braille or you could do a calendar and it was everything was right there at your fingertips. And these things uh, were expensive and prolific. And you know, we have modern versions of them today. And for the first time in the 90s, they started adding braille displays to them. And these devices uh, were very useful and a lot of blind people still use them to this day. 
Yep. So you guys were wondering, why the hell is she going to talk about the web? Well, we're, we're WebNet. I mean, why is she talking about all this other stuff? So the internet was a thing in the 90s and Gopher you know, went away and then I was not able to use it anymore. Other blind people, you know, who had access to Gopher all of a sudden weren't able to use it anymore. You know, when we first started HTML and started using HTML and the links browser, you know, was released, all of a sudden we could get formatted pages and we had, you know, columns of text and stuff like that. Well, screen readers had no idea what to do with that. And so once again, you know, as people started moving away from Gopher, because, you know, Lisa, how long were you able to update content on Gopher, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After that GUI, that yeah. Netscape or whatever, or like, mosaic, yep. who wanted Gopher? You could do pictures. Exactly. Exactly. So when it became, you know, apparent, the World Wide Web Consortium said, okay, well, we're going to have to do something about how to actually make sure that, you know, people who were using computers and need to use computers can access, you know, this internet, that's this, this new thing. So they released the World Wide Web Consortium's Web Accessibility Guidelines 1.0 in 1999. Then they did an update to that in 2008, which is the 2.0 version. They did a 2.1 release in 19, or tw sorry, 2018. And we're about to get a 2.2 release any moment now. Uh, I keep expecting to open my inbox and see it's been finally published. Right now they're you know, politically arguing over wordsmithing, but hey, at least we get something new every 10 years or so. And hopefully this time we'll get 2.2 before that. And by 2025, we'll have a new 3.0 version as well. So what are the web accessibility guidelines? What is it anyways? Um, Contrary to what people think, it is not a legal standard. It is not a standard. It is a guideline. And within the guidelines, there is the what we call the poor principles. So poor is what uh, you know the main framework of these guidelines are. It stands for, oh my God, I can't believe my head's blanking now. Uh, it stands for, perce sorry, 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 perceivable, you, you operable and understandable and robust. And I have to tell you guys, I've worked with the W3C my entire career. I've known it, you know, I, I, I knew that there was criteria and all the rest. Of this. I never actually realized up until just this year that everything that was under a one point something in the W3C was perceivable and everything that was in the two points was operable and everything in the three points was understandable. And in the fours was robust. I mean, for crying out loud, you'd think I would have gotten that eventually, right? But no, I didn't. So, you know, this is what it is. It's guidelines, it's a success criteria, and the success criteria means a way for you to be sure that a person with a disability can be successful with your website. Um, it is a standard in a way that it is recognized internationally, but it is really meant to be a guideline. Entertainment now, it's a really big important part of our lives, but up until you know, very recently, entertainment for people with disabilities was left out of the conversation. It's like, we've got all these important things to talk about. We've got medical, we've got education, but enter entertainment is really important. And entertainment is something that we've, you know, had to kind of sideline ourselves on, not anymore. In the 70s, WGBH developed the technology to broadcast closed captions into video. And this was huge. So people could get a set-top box early on and they could turn it on and they could get captions for things like, you know, it, early on it was the news, but then, you know, public television would start captioning things. And then, you know, some television shows would start including captions. And the FCC would start mandating more and more of it throughout the years. 
And then in the 90s, WGBH also developed a technology to do audio description. They said, hey, we, you know, we've come up with this technology for deaf people. Now we want to come up with a way for blind people to enjoy television as well. And audio description is a secondary, a secondary tract of audio that has a human voice reading what, you know, reading a description of what is happening on screen in real time. And for me, it was like, oh, my God, you mean this is what television has been, not just this voice on, you know, voice. And the very first show I watched with audio description was um, Sherlock Holmes. And, you know, my very first example of it was it opened up the show and it started reading the credits. And I'm going, ah, OK, not so hot. But then it said, you know. The scene opens on a dark room. Sherlock is sitting on a sofa with his feet up, smoking a hookah. And I'm like, turn to my husband. Sherlock smokes a hookah? I never knew that. It's like, how would I have known that? I mean, I only watched the TV. I didn't read the books at that point in time. And details went out. And it's just, you know, more and more, you know, I learned that entertainment was full of fun stuff that I just never knew about before. You know, I remember watching uh, episode one of Star Wars and it was the first Star Wars show I watched with audio description. And, you know, my husband grabbed my headset from me because he goes, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be seeing on screen here. So I want to hear, you know, what's important about this scene where they're fighting over top of the waterfall. <laughs> And it was just beautiful. It was engaging. It was entertaining. It was wonderful. In 2010, I believe, the FCC finally was allowed to mandate audio description, was able to mandate captioning in a lot more environments and a lot more places. And that opened up a huge new world to us. So Lucy, we're at we're at 1255. Just okay. And I am almost done. I am almost done. Yeah. So so communication, you know, anything that had communication in it had to now have captioning and had to have audio description. So video games, video games had to all of a sudden have mandated captions in them. Well, wait till the video game companies discovered that people who were using those captions were online longer and were not only people who are deaf and hard of hearing. I mean, in the disability world, we could have told them that. And now, Video gaming is incredibly accessible and they're actually leading, I think, in a lot of ways. Where we are today, see, Jesse, I told you I was almost done. <laughs> today we're at a place where new products come out that are a little bit more accessible than they would have been in the past. I'm not gonna say that everything comes out is beautifully accessible. In fact, we have several home appliances, for example, that come out that are not accessible, but you know, when a new version of the Mac operating system or a new version of Windows comes out, they do do accessibility work on that. They're not perfect. They make mistakes. Sometimes they break things, but they have mechanisms and ways for us to actually achieve that accessibility and get it back. Uh, you know, I can often see in social media, great, can anybody read messages in the new OS? whatever, 15, 17, you know, what did you do, Apple? And Apple responds to that and fixes it, you know. Windows 11, how does the screen reader do X, Y, and Z? Well, the Windows 11 team listens and watches and we can do it. Sorry, I didn't leave enough time for questions, but please, if you have any, ask away. Um, that's fine, Lucy. We still have um, about three minutes left. There's no questions in the Q&A, uh, but if anybody has any questions right now, feel free to go off mute and ask. And sorry Hi. for rushing it, everybody. <laughs> hey, Lucy, this is Abigail Hines um, from SA Comms. I do have a quick question. So you've mentioned a bunch of different like technology, screen readers, and things like that. For someone who uh, is not vision impaired, but wants to better understand the experience and perhaps create content for people who are, do you have any screen readers or technology that you would recommend? So like we could do a content check with a screen reader to make sure it's accessible. 
So we never recommend that a person who doesn't need a screen reader use a screen reader unless they're going to go permanently into the role of accessibility. Because screen readers are very, very complex and very multifaceted. You know, you could learn how to use a screen reader and be doing it completely differently than a, a blind person would actually do it. We do have access to Sight Improve on campus, and Sight Improve is a, a wonderful tool to check your content, and it will look through a bunch of things. And in another two weeks, I am actually going to be doing another uh, online session um, on testing your own work, and I will teach uh, how you can actually, you know, look at your content and look at different things to discover how it's accessible before you need to get a person with a real disability to step in and help you test it. And we'll be sharing, I'll be sharing that on the WebNet list, um, the URL to that shortly. Awesome, I'll love to, to see that. Uh, Lucy, we do have a question in the q and It's a big one, which you have about one minute to answer. It's from, uh, I'm gonna butcher your name and I'm very sorry, uh, Orlando, I think. Uh, thank you. Great presentation. Helandra from UCLP here. What do you think about AI in terms of accessibility? You got one minute. <laughs> it can go it can go both ways. Oh, wait, AI can always go both ways. There is some AI that is phenomenally helpful for people with disabilities. Uh, look up a product called Seeing AI from Microsoft. It is available on uh, iOS devices, soon to be available on Android. Amazingly a product that I can just hold up my phone and get it to describe things to me. Uh, the thing I use it for most often recently is when my machine isn't talking, I use it to read my screen to figure out what broke. Um, there is a product called Be My Eyes and Be My Eyes has an AI assistant right now that is doing incredibly amazing detailed descriptions of images. Saying all that, AI can be dangerous and AI must be approached with caution. So the Be My Eyes tool is doing a really good job of describing images, but it's not doing an accurate job of describing images. So for example, a friend of mine took a picture of himself and it, it was right in that it said, you know, a, a man with a darker complexion standing on a train station. And then it said with a blurred out face, well, actually it turned out he wasn't aiming the camera properly. So he cut off his face, he didn't blur it out. And it said wearing a backpack on one shoulder. He was actually wearing it on both shoulders. And it said wearing a dark blue shirt. And he was actually wearing a pink shirt. So that's my AI. I want to research with it. I've got some really interesting things I want to do. I think AI can do good things, but only in the right hands. Thank you, Lucy. Um, we're gonna have to end it there. It is a little bit after one. Um, there is another question in the Q&A, which um, I will email. Um, I, can also I can also stay on if, it, if anybody else can or wants to, so. Okay, um, I can stay on for another couple of minutes, but I do have a uh, one yeah. to see. This one is from um, um, Anna um, Ahern. Thank you for this presentation. What are your thoughts on processes or ways to improve accessibility on designs before they are built and can be run through site improve? I, I think it's really important to have, I mean, when you're talking about design especially, you need to have use cases of people with disabilities. You need to have personas of people with disabilities. And the best way to do that is reach out and find people with disabilities to talk to and interview. You know, I, I say it now, I've said it a million times. We have people with disabilities in this world who are very smart and very intelligent, who can help you with your design process, find some of them and bring them on board and have them be a part of your team. And they can help you create excellent products that are not only accessible, but delightful for everyone. Thank you, Lucy. We are going to end it there. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, we uh, hope to see you in a couple months at our uh, next presentation. I don't have what it is in my head, but you can visit that link I dropped into the chat to find out. I am going to stop the recording now.